Join our WhatsApp group to get daily latest updates. It's totally free. Part 1 You will hear a phone call between a woman who works for a furniture company and a customer. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 7. Listen carefully to the conversation and answer questions 1 to 7. Good afternoon, Furniture Planet. How can I help you? Hi, I'm calling about an item I ordered from your website last week. The package arrived safely, but when I opened it, I noticed that there was a part missing and that one of the pieces was broken. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. We do try to ensure that all our products reach you complete and in the best possible condition. I'm not sure how this happened. Anyway, in order to get new parts sent out to you, I need to take a few details. Is that all right? Of course. Great. First of all, can I take your full name, please? Sure, it's Gordon Cooper. Okay, great. Got that. And your address, please, Mr Cooper. It's 77 Woolbridge Lane, White Sands, and the postcode is WS178GP. Great, thank you. And the postcode was WS178GP. Right, got that. So, you mentioned before that you received a damaged item from us recently. Well, yes, damaged, but there was also a part missing. OK, and can you tell me the name of the item? Sure, no problem. It's a large pine bookcase. Main Classic, I think it was called. Uh, yes, that's right. OK, thank you. And do you have the order number there? Uh, hold on, that'll be in the email you sent over. The order number, um, let me check. Uh, ah, yes, here we are. PT9475. Great, thanks. I've just entered that into the system. Yes, I can see the bookcase here. Can I ask which parts were missing? Well, there should be three drawers to go in at the bottom, but there were only two. Right, got that. And... Which part was damaged, Mr Cooper? The top shelf. It's broken down the middle. Oh, that's strange. I'm very sorry about that. Hold on, I'll check what we can do about it. OK. Right, well, we will offer you a complete replacement. First, we will arrange for a courier to collect the old package from you. When would be a good time for that? Well, I'm busy tomorrow, so that won't do. Late Wednesday afternoon would be perfect, though. Could we say 5.30? I'm sorry, the courier only works until 5pm. Oh, OK. In that case, 4.45 would be OK. Perfect. I'll pencil you in then, at quarter to five. After that, you will receive the replacement item within five days. So that should be before this coming Saturday. Great, thanks. And finally, if there is any problem, how would you like us to contact you? By email or by telephone? By email, please. My email address is gcooper45 at mail.com. Sorry, was that 35 or 45? 45. OK. Thank you, Mr Cooper. We'll be sure to let you know if there are any problems. Before the conversation continues, you have some time to look at questions 8 to 10.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 8 to 10. Now that we've sorted that out, is there anything else I can help you with, Mr Cooper? Actually, yes there is. You see, I'm buying furniture for our lounge, so I've been looking online. Your website is very simple to find products on, but then it's difficult to know if what you're looking at is suitable because the product description pages aren't very helpful. Well, it's always useful to hear customer suggestions. How do you think we could improve? Well, I feel there's not much information about the size and weight of the items, as well as the materials used to make them. Also, although the number and content of the pictures is good, they're sometimes too small to see the details. OK, I will make a note to pass on to our web development team. Now, to get back to the items you were interested in... Yes, well, I'm looking for an armchair. The website says that you have the Washington Deluxe chair in red and in grey, but that the one I'm interested in, the blue one, is out of stock. Do you know when this will be available to order? Just a second. Yes, we'll have it in the warehouse this Friday. Would you like me to order one for you? I'm not sure yet. Firstly, how heavy is it? Just a second. It weighs... 20 kilograms. Oh, that's very good. I was worried that it would be too heavy. Great. And finally, can you tell me what material it's made of? It's not leather, is it? No, it's not. It says here that the fabric is wool. Thanks. I couldn't see because the picture was so small. Anyway, I'd like to take two of those, please. OK, I'll add that to your order. Are there any other items you're interested in? Yes, I was looking at your collection of coffee tables and... Um... That is the end of part one. You will now have half a minute to check your answers. Part 2 You will hear a guide giving a talk to visitors at a history museum. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 16. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 16. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Arvington Open Air Museum. Before you enter, let me just give you a brief overview so that you understand the place and what can be found here. Construction on the museum started in 1974, with the aim of providing a place for local children to learn about the region's rich past and its cultural identity. It has since grown much larger and now helps to educate people of all ages on life during this unique medieval period of English history. This includes all its features, both pleasant and unpleasant. This is all thanks to generous contributions from the nearby Blemford University, as well as voluntary assistance from local residents. As you walk around the site, you will meet volunteer actors playing historical roles as well as guides, students from Blemford University, who will talk you through what you see in greater detail. Their passion for history is what makes Arvington a truly unforgettable experience. Right, let me tell you a little bit about the inspiration for the museum. Just two miles east of this site, there used to be a market town known, surprisingly enough, as Arvington. This was located on the river Arving, approximately two miles east of this site, and became a successful trading town in the 13th and 14th centuries 
due to its location on a major trade route. The earliest records of the town actually go back a few centuries further. It's believed that people first built the town to cater for the nearby Clairo Abbey, which was built by monks in the 11th century. However, during the War of the Roses in 1467, the whole town was destroyed and never rebuilt. It is this original settlement that our museum hopes to recreate. Now, let me tell you a little about what you will find here. We have done our best to include all the features of the original town. It is very important to note though, before you walk around the museum, that the original town was around three times bigger. The main difference is that at least half of the original town would have been houses, while our village contains only 10 homes in total, just to show you what they would look like. There are 75 buildings in a total area of 50 acres. We are not the largest in the country, admittedly, but we pride ourselves on showing what life was really like. English History magazine recently described us as the most accurate medieval museum in Britain. We have tried to use historical construction work where possible, brought from medieval buildings around the country, including parts of the town wall and church, although most of the work is completely new. Now, let's talk in more detail about what you can find here. Before the talk continues, you have some time to look at questions 17 to 20. Now listen carefully and answer questions 17 to 20. Before you begin your walk around the museum, you may be interested to learn a little about specific things you can do here today. You can visit Arvington on two separate days and have completely different experiences thanks to a variety of talks, shows and activities we put on. Today, for example, we have an experienced blacksmith working with us who will show you how to make swords and horseshoes, and even let you try yourself. Make your way down to the forge to see what you are capable of. If hitting metal things with other metal things doesn't interest you, how about heading down to the tailors for a more gentle afternoon's activity? A team of volunteers will provide you with a detailed introduction to medieval clothing, complete with a range of examples that they've created. If you have a taste for medieval skirts and shirts, you can even buy clothing here. Those of you who are particularly interested in arts and handmade items have chosen the perfect time to visit us, as we're currently holding Crafts Week as a celebration of the outstanding craftsmanship and artistry of the medieval age. We have set up stalls showing the work of skilled craftsmen and women, from carpenters to jewellers in the marketplace. You will be amazed by just how skilled these people were, and are. When you get to the marketplace, you may begin to find parts of the museum familiar. This is probably because several scenes from the popular historical drama series Sir Rufus the Ready were shot here at Arvington. In fact, the famous scene in which Sir Rufus met the Scottish King took place in the town hall at the far end of the marketplace. There are talks here every day about the local history of the area, including the aforementioned event at two o'clock. Now, to keep the children entertained, how about some more activities centred more around... That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Part 3. You will hear a discussion between three students about a community project.
First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 27. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 27. So, are we going to make a start on the community project for the summer? I've had some ideas. What were you thinking, Karen? If I remember correctly, the project has to last around two weeks, something to help others in the community. Wasn't it ten days? No, I'm sure it was a fortnight. Yeah, Tom's right. And I was thinking, what about doing something with local children? I've got some connections at the sports centre and I thought we could set up a summer sports school. Do you think they'd let us use their facilities? I mentioned it at the gym the other day. There's no problem. As long as we use the outdoor courts and pitches, we might be able to use the sports hall, though the swimming pool is definitely off limits. That sounds perfect. I could organise an outdoor football skills course. But wasn't the idea of the community project about fundraising for charity? Oh, I'm not sure. Yeah, I remember that too, Olga. Hang on, I've got the assessment guide from the uni on my phone. Um, just a moment. Yes, we need to do what Olga says. They even have some suggestions of local organisations here. OK, that's important then. We'll need to think of some ideas. Um, what about a tournament to round everything off? We could organise some competitions and an entry fee to fundraise. Your football course would work perfectly, Tom. I love it, Karen. I could do basketball. Would we be able to do that inside? They've got a court outside, haven't they, Karen? Yep, so as long as the weather is reasonable. If we don't get very dry weather, we might have to do something indoors, so planning for that eventuality could be a good idea. Good point, Tom. Well, could I suggest we do something with music? Maybe a dance course? If we could get the permission to use the sports hall? The kids could do the choreography for the final tournament. If we couldn't use the sports hall, we could still do it outside, though it wouldn't be ideal. Excellent. So, we've got three ideas. Ah, and we need to decide which charity to donate our funds to. Though, it's also about raising awareness for these organizations, too. So, if the Sports Centre is happy with all of this, we just need to decide some dates. Should we do that and decide which charity to choose? Then we can go and see them and present our plan. Before the conversation continues, you have some time to look at questions 28 to 30. Now listen carefully and answer questions 28 to 30. I think the beginning of August would be the best time for the project. Great. We just have to decide on the charity now. Tom, didn't you have some written down with the assessment guide? Yes, one was Aid UK and... I wrote one down here. Um, Heart Association. And Karen, did you suggest another one? The EFA, Education for All. I thought it would be good to give the funds to a charity connected to learning, but we have to consider that the project focuses on sport, so I don't know. What else do you know about it, Karen? Just that it gives aid to poorer families in the UK who can't afford to put their children through university, so it gives them a chance to fulfil their dreams. I think I've convinced myself. I would definitely opt for this one. 
That one's also my favorite. I agree, it sounds like the best idea too. But we should also consider the other two options. They're all so worthwhile, it's hard to choose. Let's discuss heart association. I mean, the name kind of speaks for itself in terms of what they do. Then we'll consider Aid UK. That's the sports one. Well, in my opinion, I'm not sure it's really connected to the project. Do you think the best option could be Aid UK? Because this one is so closely linked to sports, isn't it? What do you know about it, Karen? Mm, not a lot. Just that they promote sports for people of all ages, so there are parallels with the project. It seems the most connected to our project. It just seems to make the most sense. Mm, I'm not sure. I totally agree with what you say, Karen. But I still think our first choice should stand. We all agreed on that one. We did. Let's stay with our first choice. All agreed? Okay for me. And me. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Part 4. You will hear part of a seismology lecture about volcanoes. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. In today's Introduction to Seismology lecture, we'll be looking at predicting volcanic eruptions. The destruction caused by a large volcano can be devastating. And with more of them being increasingly surrounded by urban areas, it is more important than ever before to be able to predict and plan for an eruption. After all, there's no way to prevent this massive natural force. So, what can we do to predict when a volcano is going to erupt? The first sign that we need to look for is earthquakes. In the run-up to an eruption, there are often hundreds of small earthquakes caused by magma rising up through cracks in the Earth's crust. As magma comes into contact with rocks, they crack, which causes a mini-earthquake. And now, many of these earthquakes are too small to be detected by people, which is why the ground around earthquakes in densely populated areas needs to be constantly monitored by seismometers. These are instruments which measure the motion of the Earth's surface, and a higher frequency of these earthquakes could indicate an upcoming eruption. Another important area which needs to be monitored is the temperature around volcanoes. There are lots of volcanic features like steam vents, geysers and hot springs that are expected to be consistently hot, but any spikes in this could indicate dangerous volcanic activity. Technology has had a huge impact on the way we collate this data. The safest way for us to assess this is to take images using satellites, as collecting this data from the ground can be hazardous. In addition to the frequency and size of earthquakes, and the temperature around volcanoes, the final indicator that we assess is the atmospheric conditions around the volcano. Now, most active volcanoes release a range of gases, but higher than normal rates of sulphur and carbon dioxide emissions can reveal a lot about the magma system of the volcano, and could also be a telltale sign of danger. In order for this to be monitored, gas samples need to be taken and checked using a spectrometer which are types of chemical sensors. These monitoring techniques are becoming increasingly advanced, and some earthquakes, like Mount St. Helens in the US and Mount Vesuvius in Italy, 
are monitored 24 hours a day by teams of scientists for the safety of the inhabitants living around them. However, understanding and predicting when a blast is imminent is only the first stage in keeping people safe. We also need to have an effective emergency plan prepared. When faced with a major volcanic incident, authorities need to take a number of steps to reduce civilian casualties. The first is to calculate an exclusion zone around a volcano where an eruption is imminent. This would stop anyone from entering the area. The size of the zone would vary depending on the predicted scale of eruption. There is one in effect in Montserrat, which has been in place since 1995. In addition to stopping people entering the zone, authorities need to be ready to get people out. Being prepared for a large-scale evacuation is key, as people will be panicking and major transit routes will be quickly blocked. All of this costs money, so obviously a government needs to have the funds to deal with these emergencies. Having an advanced communication system in place is a must, in order to notify people of both the dangers and the action that is being taken. Finally, it is important to know that an eruption could occur at any time. Citizens living near particularly active volcanoes need to be educated about both emergency procedures and also the basic provisions that they will need to keep in their house to assist them in times of emergency. Now, let's look in more detail at the design of a seismometer. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.